The world is navigating a troubling economic situation. Inflation has become a global issue concerning policymakers and private citizens equally. Energy and supply chain woes are continuous. Interest rates, consumer prices, and cost of living have soared, with many economists positing that the current trajectory is indicative of a coming recession. The World Economic Forum cites poverty and social inequality as ranking second on the list of global concerns. Amid a myriad of concurrent economic crises, how do we recover? How can we address such financial distress and inequity? And how might we go about enacting more permanent resolution? This is Megan Schaefer for the Oxford Comment. On today's episode, the first for 2023, we spoke with two OUP authors on the social safety net, the ethical implications of extreme wealth, and what steps can be taken to achieve economic equality. For our first interview, we spoke with Chris Howard, Professor of Government and Public Policy at the College of William & Mary and author of Who Cares? The Social Safety Net in America. He addressed the social safety net in the United States and how discussions on poverty vary in the U.S. according to social stratification. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. My name is Chris Howard. I've been teaching at the College of William & Mary for almost 30 years. Uh, my specialty is American politics and public policy. And in particular, most of my writing is about the history and politics of US social policy. Thank you so much. Your book is the first comprehensive map of the social safety net, public and private, in the United States. Summarily, what is the social safety net in America? How does it differ from the social safety nets in other countries and why? My notion of the social safety net is a fairly broad one. It's how we, as a society, help individuals cope with material hardship. So that notion of we goes beyond government. Uh, government provides the public safety net, and it's very important. But in my book, I also look at the role of charities, uh, both religious and secular charities, and what's sometimes called the family safety net of relatives and uh, close friends who often provide important forms of care. When I talk about material hardships, so these are things like income, food, housing, uh, medical care and daily care, uh, child care and long-term care. I'm not covering uh, either social poverty, sort of feelings of isolation, or spiritual poverty. And my notion of the safety net, which is fairly common, is that it catches people after they have fallen on hard times. And so by that definition, it does not include efforts to prevent poverty like K through 12 education. In terms of how the U.S. differs, so um, in other affluent democracies, most European countries, Canada, Australia, uh, the public-private mix is usually different. Um, in other countries, there's usually greater reliance on government to relieve hardship and less reliance on charity than in this country. And in those other countries, the government programs tend to be more inclusive, like national health insurance or paid family leave. The United States is unusual in how much we rely on means-tested programs like Medicaid and public housing to provide a, a safety net. Now, the last piece of the question in terms of why, that's a huge topic. There's an enormous literature there. A number of scholars say that the differences between the U.S. and these other countries is rooted in distinctive values like individualism and self-sufficiency. Uh, others point to the weakness of organized labor or the fragmentation of our governing institutions or race. Uh, my book's really just about the, the U.S. It's not about these other countries, but it is informed by those other countries, particularly because I think we do need to pay attention to uh, charities when talking about the, the safety net. The last thing I'll mention is that my book, when it talks about the public safety net, includes both means-tested and inclusive programs, that both of them provide real important forms of assistance to people with hardship. Uh, in fact, Social Security, which is almost universal in this country, lifts more Americans out of poverty than any other social program. Distinct parts of American society discuss poverty and economic inequality differently. What do these conversations look like? 
Broadly speaking, some parts of society emphasize work while others emphasize need. If you read the national party platforms for Democrats and for Republicans, you'll hear a lot about work. The way to get ahead in society is to be employed and government should really help workers, working families, working men, working women. Now, clearly Democrats and Republicans differ about how government should help, but they do agree on who should be helped. If you listen to the statements of labor unions and major business associations, you'll hear similar themes. On the other hand, if you listen to churches and secular charities, they do not focus so heavily on workers. They care about needs. Their mission is to serve the needy, whether or not they're employed. Democrats and labor unions, you'll hear them talking a lot about programs for workers like Social Security, Medicare, um, the earned income tax credit, minimum wage laws. Churches and other charities will talk about some of those same programs, but they'll also talk about low income housing, SNAP, or what's often called food stamps, and Medicaid. In practice, does the United States have a single safety net, or do the parts differ in important ways? Well, that depends. Uh, if you're interested in the public-private mix of sort of who's helping to finance and who's helping to provide uh, assistance, then the parts of our safety net definitely do vary. Um, in the income support side, we rely very heavily on the public safety net. We rely very heavily on government programs like Social Security, unemployment insurance, disability insurance, the earned income tax credit. Organized charities in this country seldom give out cash, and in the history of charitable giving, they have seldom given out cash. They tend to focus more on in-kind kinds of benefits, like food, in the case of food pantries or soup kitchens, um, sometimes medical care in the form of free and charitable clinics, uh, and a li little bit in the housing area, uh, sometimes homeless shelters. The family safety net is crucial for what I call daily care. We have millions of parents and relatives providing unpaid child care and unpaid long-term care. Uh, the family safety net also turns out to be important in housing too. Relatives share housing partly because it's just too expensive to buy or rent, especially for young adults. Uh, and they may share housing to take care of relatives who are old, disabled, or both. On the other hand, if you wanna know who's falling through the safety net, who's not getting covered very well, then the story is pretty much the same in every single part of our social safety net. And that is that blacks and Hispanics are more likely to live in poverty. They're more likely to be food insecure. They're more likely to be homeless, more likely to be spending at least half of their income on rent and they're more likely to be medically uninsured. Much of your research was conducted prior to COVID-19, and your book concludes with an assessment of how the social safety net performed during the pandemic. Can you share some of your observations? Right, my book is mostly a portrait of the social safety net in the first two decades of this century. I was actually researching and writing this book when the pandemic started and decided to sort of bracket and discuss those events in a postscript. So that's basically, that section is sort of early to 2020 to early 2022, which is not a huge span of time, but a lot did happen. First, the national government played to its historic strength in income support and cut a lot of checks. That's what it does historically, and it's very good at it. Unemployment checks were deliberately increased and extended for more weeks. There were, of course, the new stimulus checks. For at least 2021, the child tax credit was expanded as well. There were other government programs that expanded automatically to help people who lost their jobs and their health insurance. So we had millions more people on SNAP, meaning food stamps. We had millions more people on Medicaid. The national and state governments, besides the sort of spending side of things, also through essentially regulations, 
made it harder for people to be evicted from their apartments and their homes. On the charitable side, charities had a really hard time the first months of the pandemic. For health reasons, uh, food pantries and soup kitchens just had trouble staying open and operating. The same was true for many free and charitable medical clinics, but they gradually bounced back and were operating more or less normally by the beginning of 2021. If we look at the funding side, charitable giving in this country grew a little during the pandemic, but not a lot and certainly not enough to keep up with the huge increase in need. The bottom line though is really quite remarkable. Despite a devastating pandemic, poverty in this country did not spike up. In fact, if you use the government's, what they call the supplemental poverty measure, which technically is more accurate than the official poverty line, by that measure, poverty in this country actually dropped in 2021. And that's mostly because the public safety net, government programs, expanded to take care of millions of people who were dealing with significant hardships. And I think one of the real success stories in the last few years is just that a lot of truly terrible outcomes were avoided. There was certainly hardship, but it could have been a a lot worse. What can be done to address the ongoing gaps in the social safety net? Is one approach clearly superior, or do you see reasons why different approaches might work? I hope that people who read my book will come away with an appreciation for how much hardship the social safety net does relieve, both the government activities, charitable activities, family activities, but also how much remains to be done. Uh, I don't think a good approach is to expect a lot more out of the charitable sector. They do a lot of good, but frankly, their resources are limited. Uh, In fact, leaders of major charities often describe their work as providing a safety net to the safety net. For example, when individuals find that their food stamps are running out, they often turn to food pantries and soup kitchens to help make up the difference. Likewise, I think the family safety net is already stretched thin. Uh, The people we count on to provide unpaid long-term care to their relatives Those caregivers are often stressed emotionally and financially. If we focus on this public safety net, I can see a few different options. We could rely on inclusive social insurance programs, uh, maybe broaden long-term care coverage as part of Medicare, uh, maybe increase social security benefits for the very old. Social insurance was a very popular approach in this country for much of the 20th century, but expanding those programs has been tougher in recent decades. Another approach would be to focus on programs that are really aimed more precisely at low-income people, but not just target them at people living below the poverty line. So in, in this case, Medicaid and the Earned Income Tax Credit might be models of how you can help the poor and near poor. We do know, though, from history that the more leeway you give states, the more likely you'll see inequality. About a dozen states right now, as most readers realize, have not yet expanded Medicaid since the Affordable Care Act became law. One thing that actually intrigued me about the Biden administration's Build Back Better proposal from a year ago was that, in fact, they seem to be trying to create a a hybrid of these two approaches. A couple of the bigger pieces of that initiative would have created inclusive programs for things like child care and long-term care, but would not have financed them with payroll taxes, which is the way we usually handle those programs like Social Security and Medicare. Instead, what the Biden administration was proposing was to finance them basically from greater income tax revenue from the richest Americans. And that's more how we pay for things like Medicaid and food stamps. Now, whichever approach we take, I think it makes sense to focus first on the big ticket items that families are struggling with. And right now in this country, at the top of that list would probably be housing, long-term care, and child care. Those are very difficult, often very expensive for millions of Americans to afford, 
not only those low income, but those even with sort of average incomes as well. And unfortunately, those were parts of Build Back Better that were not enacted, uh, but those needs definitely are still quite pressing. In conclusion, could you expand on what are the key facets of the social safety net and whether or not they will still be accessible to future generations? Sure, I can talk about a couple of them. So one piece that's absolutely crucial is social security. As I mentioned, it's done enormous amount of good, especially lifting senior citizens out of poverty. And as some listeners may know, the forecast for social security right now is that while the trust fund today is in good shape, it's not looking so good in the future. It's not really a concern that Social Security is going bankrupt because it's always getting replenished by payroll taxes, but that it won't have enough money to pay the full benefits. And we have been in this position before in the late 70s, early 80s. uh, The trust fund was actually in worse shape than it is now. And policymakers, Democrats and Republicans, managed to craft a proposal um, to essentially give Social Security several decades more life. Um, And I'm hopeful, frankly, that some sort of package will come about. The sort of secret from back in the early 80s was finding a proposal that spread the pain around. So not to go after just the elderly, not to go after just workers, not to go after just the affluent, but to expect everybody to pitch in in some ways and to find a package that reduces benefits perhaps for some, perhaps the more affluent elderly, and finds ways of increasing revenue. In my classes, I tell my students, if you're really looking for something to worry about, I'd be less concerned about Social Security for your future than I would be health care, because health care costs are just much more difficult to predict and to control than Social Security. A second piece that came up, particularly in the pandemic, was the child tax credit. And there are a number of studies showing that the child tax credit did a tremendous amount of good for families with young children, not just poor, but near poor, and really helped cut child poverty in this country. Unfortunately, the child tax credit has been allowed to expire. And so those benefits are not being felt this year. And there are efforts in Washington right now by Democrats and Republicans to try to revive the child tax credit um, and to sort of restore some of the changes that were uh, in in effect last year. If you get into the details there, there are some significant differences between Democrats and Republicans about how they'd like to do that. On the Republican side, they talk about expanding the child tax credit at the same time as they cut spending for a number of programs. And so that the net increase in government spending is essentially zero or may even be cut. And I'm almost positive Democrats aren't going to go along with that. What they really want is a net increase in the child tax credit. And to sort of think of the child tax credit along with the earned income tax credit, which does have bipartisan support, as essentially our equivalent to um, European style family policies and family allowances. Uh, It's just that we run them through the tax code and that seems to make them more popular. And that I think in general, that sort of uh, approach of helping families with children through the tax code has some appeal across party lines because it doesn't require necessarily that people pay for childcare. If you wanna take care of your children at home, have stay at home parents, you can benefit from the earned income tax credit and you can benefit from the child tax credit. The last piece I'll mention, this gets more at the family safety net. There are, I think, legitimate reasons to worry about the family safety net being as helpful in you know the next 10 or 20 years as it is now in part because you've got more people who are divorcing or never getting married um you've got to some extent some weaker family ties and so people are either going to have to count on 
sort of extended family in the sense of close friends, not necessarily blood relatives, but close friends to help care for them as they grow older. Or we're going to have more people relying on the public safety net, uh, particularly Medicaid, for help with their long-term care. Thank you so much, Chris, for joining us today. Thank you, I really appreciate it. Our second guest was Tom Allison, Associate Professor of Social Justice and Peace Studies at King's University College at Western University, London, Ontario, and the author of Against Inequality, The Practical and Ethical Case for Abolishing the Super Rich. Tom argued on behalf of the rejection of meritocracy and defended the radical scholarship supporting such action. I would like to welcome Tom Mallison, the author of Against Inequality. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. My book is called Against Inequality, uh, The Practical and Ethical Case for Abolishing the Super Rich. So I'm an associate professor of social justice and peace studies at uh, King's University College at Western University. That's in London, Ontario, in Canada. Um, and my book is, as I said, about the practical and ethical issues about the super rich. So there's obviously been lots written about inequality in general. This book is about the issue of the super rich, the multimillionaires and billionaires. I examine the practical questions of what it would mean to raise taxes to actually deal effectively with the super rich. Can we have wealth taxes? Can we deal with tax havens? And then the ethical questions of do rich people truly deserve their wealth? Is meritocracy a valid perspective? And the book tries to weave together those concrete practical concerns and the ethical concerns to give a kind of overarching picture of what's going on in our society, the dangers that inequality poses, and what we can do to uh, ameliorate the situation. Your book presents a novel and provocative argument in favor of abolishing the super rich. And this argument is substantiated by your research, which in part concludes the sheer mathematical impossibility of billionaires. Can you substantiate further the pragmatic necessity behind abolishing the super rich? Thanks, Megan. So first, I should clarify, it's not that billionaires are impossible. Billionaires exist. There are currently about 2,500 of them, about 700 in the US, about 45 here in Canada. The point is that a world in which you have billionaires on the one hand and incredible deprivation on the other, homelessness, hunger, there are 900 million people around the globe today that live in extreme poverty. That's less than $1.90 a day. Every day, 17,000 kids die from poverty-related illness. So it's that combination of opulence beside utter destitution that is completely unjust and should not be allowed to continue. So the point is not that the super rich are individually evil, it's that their existence is structurally immoral, I think. So, you know, as individuals, they, they shouldn't be harmed, but their social position, I think, ha a, a society and a, that allows billionaires to exist, I think is, is incompatible with a just society. How does society elevate the super rich? What myths or beliefs are perpetuated? We live in an era of really remarkable wealth idolatry. There's a never ending stream of television shows, blogs, podcasts, and social media admiring, you know, the Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and Warren Buffett, Steve Jobs, and so on. I just saw that Netflix has a new show called Inside Bill's Brain, which is essentially about how smart and wonderful Bill Gates is. There's a never ending flow of news articles and puff pieces about what a genius Elon Musk is and how generous Warren Buffett is. The problem with such cheerleading of the rich is that it perpetuates the myth that rich people deserve their wealth and even worse, the myth that billionaires are good for society. 
And in fact, the wealthy do not deserve their income. This is a central focus of my book, this question of deservingness. In a nutshell, rich people do not deserve their income because it does not mainly derive from anything that specific individual does. Their income is much more due to what I call the vast understructure of other people's labor. In other words, if you put Bill Gates or Elon Musk on a desert island without other people to work for them and care for them, without all the massive physical infrastructure, the cultural infrastructure, without the technological infrastructure, without the legal infrastructure, and so on, they would produce next to nothing. The only reason that they're able to produce so much today is because they're extremely lucky and extremely privileged to stand on the shoulders of the immense collective labor of our society. So wealth is created collectively. It's created by societies, not by particular individuals. And I think that it's wrong to think that rich people are, are good for society in general, because the more wealth that they hoard means the more that poor people suffer and the more that our democratic system based on equality is undermined. So a central argument of my book is that we as a society would actually be far, far better off if we taxed the super rich out of existence. If we raised taxes very high, had a wealth tax, et cetera, I think the costs to society of those high taxes would be really minor. There would be minor reductions in economic growth, but the benefits of doing so, the benefits of redistributing the money of the super rich would be enormous. We could use that money to protect the environment, to abolish poverty, to guarantee that everyone has economic security. That would really help to reduce racism and xenophobia, so much of which stems from fear and insecurity. We could also safeguard our democracy. We could guarantee equal opportunity for everyone to live good and flourishing lives. So in other words, the, the costs of getting rid of the billionaires would be only minor, but I think the benefits would be enormous. So that's all to say that we don't need the rich, quite the opposite. Society would be immensely better off without them. There is now substantial anxiety around the economy, inflation and recession. What impact does economic uncertainty and instability have on our relationship with the super rich? Right. So these last few years have been great for the rich. They've been a misery for most other people, but they've been great for the rich. So during the first six months of the COVID-19 pandemic, 250,000 Americans died. 20 million people lost their jobs. It's been the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. And yet, the billionaires in the country saw their wealth increase by a third, going from about $3 trillion to about $4 trillion in total. So when we're thinking about the recent uncertainty, I think the deep fact to keep at the front of our mind is that all the insecurity that exists today is completely and utterly unnecessary. You know, in, in Canada today, 20% of people lack access to affordable housing. In the US, 9% of people lack health insurance. 63% of full-time parents can't afford childcare. In other words, economic insecurity is endemic, and yet it's completely unnecessary. Historically, most human beings were insecure for the simple and obvious reason that society was poor. There simply were not enough resources to provide for everyone's needs. But that is manifestly not the case today. Today, we have enough resources to guarantee everyone's ability to lead good, secure, flourishing lives. But we don't because we prefer to allow the rich to hoard the bulk of our resources. So that's the important deep fact to keep in mind that if miraculously the US were to transform itself tomorrow into a you know a radically egalitarian country 
we decided to spread income and working hours relatively evenly among the population. What that would mean is that every adult could have the same median income that exists today with even better public services than exist in Sweden, plus a basic income. And each worker would only need to work three and a half hours a day. Now, of course, that's not going to happen anytime soon, but the numbers don't lie. It's economically possible. We have enough for everyone to lead good, flourishing lives. The obstacle is political will. The deprivation, the insecurity that exists today, it's not natural, it's not inevitable. It's the result, ultimately, of political choice. And I think we should make different choices. Is meritocracy inherently immoral? <laughs> right, this is a great question. So meritocracy, the idea that you get what you deserve, is a central pillar of our society. It's a very common and widespread belief. So let me give you a couple of examples. A, a campaign manager for the Republican Party in Ohio recently said, quote, if you're black and you haven't been successful in the last 50 years, it's your own fault. Likewise, presidential candidate Herman Cain, folks may remember he was a recent presidential candidate for the Republicans. He said, quote, don't blame Wall Street. Don't blame the big banks. If you don't have a job and you're not rich, blame yourself. So that's meritocracy. So is that immoral? That's a it's a big question. A couple of chapters in my book grapple with it. It's it's hard and complicated. I think the conservative arguments are widespread and powerful, but I do ultimately think that they're wrong. The first thing to say is that regardless of whether you think meritocracy is a good or bad idea, it absolutely does not exist right now. The U.S. is nowhere near being a meritocratic society because there is nothing like level playing field. Opportunity today is severely, severely unequal. Women earn 49 cents to the dollar when you compare men and women over a 15 year period. Poor inner city schools, often with large populations of racialized students, receive about $3,000 per student, whereas wealthy private schools, often of largely white populations, cost up to 40,000 per student. Children of the rich are 75% more likely to go to university than children of poor families. Of the richest 400 people on the Forbes rich list, over half of those people were born of over a million dollars, inherited over a million bucks. So the evidence is overwhelming. The US is not a meritocracy, far, far from it. Nevertheless, there is I think an interesting philosophical question of, well, what if there were more equality of opportunity? What if there were less racism, less inheritance? In that case, would we say that meritocracy is right, that rich people deserve to be rich, poor people deserve to be poor? That's a fascinating question, but my answer is still no. It's true. Of course, that some people are more talented than others, some people work harder than others. But when we think carefully about it, we see that possessing talent, having the ability to work hard, those things are ultimately due to luck. None of us choose our personalities. We don't choose our own ability to concentrate, our own perseverance, our own bodily energy, our own intelligence. We don't choose whether we'll have chronic fatigue or a love of studying. Human bodies are different. There's no such thing as a level playing field between our, our bodily abilities. And that means that rewarding some people with much better lives than others simply because they luckily possess more talent or more effort or more self-cultivating skill is wrong. It's akin to rewarding people for having white skin or for having blue eyes. It's, it's arbitrary and it's unfair. So people are just different due to their genes, due to their circumstances, which are out of their control. So ultimately, the fact that some people have more productive bodies than others, that shouldn't translate into having substantially more money because the productivity of your body is due mainly to luck. So 
I think of meritocracy as essentially a kind of ableism. It's a kind of prejudice similar to racism or sexism. It's a prejudice which says that people who have more able bodies, who are stronger or more productive than others, should have better lives, even though such advantages are arbitrary from a moral point of view. So in contrast, I, I think that society should aim to distribute income and wealth, not on the basis of what people deserve, but equally or on the basis of what people need. Right? As a society, I think we should talk much less about deservingness and talk much more about need. So I, I love the this quote from the famous US historian Howard Zinn, who once said, quote, give people what they need, food, medicine, clean air, pure water, trees and grass, pleasant homes to live in, some hours of work, more hours of leisure. Don't ask who deserves it. Every human being deserves it. I think that's right. I think people should be guaranteed the things they need to lead good lives because they are human beings, not because of what their bodies can or cannot do. Are millionaires inherently immoral? I think the answer to that is is the same for the super rich. Like whether we're talking about someone who's a multimillionaire or someone who's a billionaire, it's not that individually they're a bad person that we should, you know, be out to harm them. But it's that the, a society that allows some people to accumulate so much wealth while other people face such deprivation, such hardship, is wrong. So no one, in my view, deserves their income. Income comes from incredible inequality of opportunity. Where wealth comes from in the first place is what I've called the understructure, right? This vast collection of different types of infrastructures, political, legal, cultural, care, and so on. So everyone, when they're in the economy working and producing, is doing so on the shoulders of millions of people who came before them. And that's true for millionaires and billionaires. So I think the core point is that it's the inequality that's the problem. Millionaires, of course, are less rich than billionaires. And so the danger that they pose to society in terms of the amount of money that they hoard and their danger to our democracy is less, right? Millionaires have less influence over politicians than billionaires. But the same basic ethical principle, I think, applies that we want to have a society where everyone gets their needs met, where everyone is able to lead good and flourishing lives. And because of that, we should seriously consider raising taxes to a high level on multimillionaires as well as billionaires. You know, our society is very used to the idea of having a minimum wage, but we need to seriously consider also having maximum wages. And it's a tough question about what exactly that maximum wage should be. There's not going to be one clear, crisp answer. But one of the central hopes from my book is that I would really love that to be a broader conversation that people are having, you know, around their dinner tables, by their water coolers, and definitely in the halls of government. Like, what is the, the maximum amount of money that it is sensible and ethical for any human being to have? That's a kind of foreign idea currently, but I think it's a crucial one. Because if you don't think there's a maximum, you're saying that it's actually okay for certain individuals to own everything. I don't think anyone really believes that. But I think we need to have that question much more clearly and forthrightly. What's the maximum amount of money that's acceptable? So I think we should start having that conversation as a society and start moving towards actually implementing those maximum limits. Inequality has worsened over the past 30 years. How problematic is this trend? What are the contributing factors behind it? And how can we best mitigate these circumstances? Right. So inequality has worsened in most places around the world, not everywhere. So in some countries like Denmark and France, inequality has increased only a small amount. But in many places like the U.S., in particular, but also the UK, Canada, and elsewhere, it has really exploded. So in the US today, 
the top 1% of Americans own 40% of the country's wealth. The bottom 40% of Americans own virtually nothing, 0.2%. So take uh, Elon Musk, right? Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, the richest person in the world, although that ebbs and flows, for those who've been following the recent Twitter um, escapades. But the last couple of years, he's been the richest person in the world. Of uh, Last time I checked, a wealth of $270 billion. So think about that for a second. $270 billion Elon Musk has. How much would an average American have to work to get that much money? The answer is seven and a half million years. Or to put it the other way around, the total amount of money that a typical American will earn in their whole life after, say, 40 years of work is the same as would be earned by Musk in 14 minutes. So enormous inequality today and what can be done about it. So economists talk about two main dimensions of the issue. Predistributive measures, that means things that change the amount of money that we're able to earn. And then redistributive measures, that means taxing from some to give to others. So let me say a, a quick word about each of those. So in terms of pre-distributive measures, there are a lot of things that could and should be done. So the big ones are things like increasing the strength of unions, improving access to education, raising the minimum wage, limiting CEO pay. More radically, it would be immensely helpful to introduce a basic income and to start trying to democratize workplaces so that more of the profit of businesses flows to workers at large rather than just a small minority of rich shareholders. So all of those things and, and many more are clearly important. Uh, my book focuses more on redistribution. To really deal with inequality, the most important tool is that of taxation. Now, of course, there's a big debate about taxation. On the one hand, some people worry that it's simply not possible to tax the rich, that they will always manage to avoid taxes by using loopholes or hiding their money in tax havens. On the other hand, some people think that even if it were possible to tax the rich, you shouldn't do so because taxes would cause the rich to stop working, stop investing, and everyone will suffer. So a big part of my book is about carefully, cautiously investigating these arguments. What does the evidence say? Well, what I find is that it is possible to raise high taxes on the rich. It's not easy to do so, but it is completely viable. Over the last 70 years, we've seen many, many successful examples of countries introducing really high taxes. It's been done successfully in many places, in Sweden and Denmark, in the UK, Japan, and even here in the US. Right In the US, at the end of the Second World War, 1944, 1945, the marginal income tax rate on the rich reached a high of 94%. And indeed, in 1970, the richest people paid an incredible 75% of their total income on taxes. In other words, for every dollar that a millionaire made, they paid 75 cents to the state. So high taxes are possible. Moreover, when you look carefully at the evidence about the costs and the benefits of high taxes, quite a clear picture emerges. Having high taxes probably would lead to some costs in terms of economic growth, but I think they'd be pretty minor. Think about rich people like LeBron James, right? He's not going to stop playing basketball regardless of the taxes. He plays because he loves the game, right? Most rich people do their jobs not simply for the money, but for the prestige, the respect, the status. Likewise, even if high taxes led rich people to invest somewhat less, that's not necessarily a big problem because the state will have a lot more money that it can invest in public goods. So better schools, better hospitals, better roads, free internet, whatever. 
So reductions in private investment may well be more or less balanced by increases in public investment. So high taxes will likely have some costs, I think. That's true. But only minor ones. On the other hand, the benefits of high taxes, I think, are likely to be astronomical. So one of the most interesting things I found in researching this book over the last few years was the truly immense benefits that are likely to come from high taxes and reduced inequality. So maybe I'll quickly mention the the main ones. So first, there would be much better environmental sustainability. The rich currently emit far more carbon than the rest of us. The richest 1% emit 175 times more carbon than the bottom 10%. So if we redistributed their wealth, we could use it for enhanced public green investment, things like clean energy and public transit. Second, there would be much more democratic equality. At the moment, the rich currently distort our democracy by lobbying politicians, influencing the media. Think of, again, Elon Musk and um, the purchase of Twitter. That's terrible for democracy. And redistributing their wealth would enable us to protect the crucial ideal of democratic equality. One person, one vote. The rich should not have more influence than the rest of us. Third, redistributing income would allow us to guarantee equal opportunity and economic security for everyone. For example, if we redistributed only 2% of the wealth of only two people, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates, we could completely eliminate homelessness in the US. So by redistributing wealth from the super rich, we could guarantee that every American resident has an affordable home, health care, child care, free education, free university, a good pension, and much more. Fourth, if high taxes are spent on increasing economic security for everyone, that would significantly douse the flames of right-wing populism, racism, and xenophobia, right? Right Right-wing populism is, of course, a major issue in our world today. It's a complicated one. It has many different causes, but one of the main causes is economic insecurity because it's out of the soil of fear that resentment and racism and even fascism grow. And given how scary it is to see the rise of this right-wing populism, to see actual Nazis marching on the streets, it's really hard to exaggerate the importance of this benefit of high taxes. So yeah, so those are not the only benefits. I think the evidence shows that reducing inequality also tends to create less social friction, less intolerance, more social trust, more solidarity, better mental health, particularly in terms of depression, and less crime, such as homicide and robbery. But those four big benefits are the main ones. So the bottom line is that the costs of high taxes and low inequality are likely to be only moderate, whereas the benefits are potentially enormous, a different order of magnitude altogether. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tom. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure. We want to thank our guests, Chris Howard and Tom Mallison, for speaking with us about economic inequality, contributing factors, and what steps we may still take towards resolution. Please explore our show notes on the OUP blog for a recommended reading list exploring just a few of the ideas discussed today. New episodes of the Oxford Comment will premiere on the last Tuesday of each month. Be sure to follow Oxford Academic on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, and YouTube to stay up to date on upcoming podcast episodes. While you're at it, please do subscribe to the Oxford Comment wherever you regularly listen to podcasts, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. Lastly, we want to thank the crew of the Oxford Comment for their assistance on today's episode. Episode 79 was produced by Stephen Filippi and me, Megan Schaefer. Thank you for listening.